Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? Maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. We'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes. We'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community. We believe that it's our job to make it a better place. No matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're with us today. We hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out his plan for us. Welcome to Craig Albert Church. Good morning and welcome to Craig Albert Church Online. Thank you so much for connecting with us this morning. I really am glad that you're here. If this is your first time, then why don't you leave us a wee comment and let us know who you are and where you're from. It was great to have some new folks again last week and every week we get to see new people connect with us here at Craig Albert Church from all over the world, but locally as well. We're going to come again and just spend some time in worship. Steph McLeod has um, recorded an amazing version of a beautiful old hymn that we're going to enjoy a wee bit later on. And we're going to finish the series on Jonah that we've been looking at and see what God has to say for us today. But before we do that, let's just take a minute to pray, to come before God and give him his place, to thank him for being with us right now and to ask him to speak in a powerful way. Let's pray together. Father, we come into your presence now and I thank you, God, that you want to, to move in my life. You want to move in the lives of those who are watching. And Lord, as we come, we want to give you praise for who you are. Thank you that you're an almighty and an all-powerful God, but yet you still want to connect with us. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to have the boldness to respond. And help us, Lord, as we worship, just to reflect on how awesome you are. Lord, be with us now as we come into this time. And again, I pray, Lord, that if you want to do something in us new, then I pray, Lord, that we would hear your word and we would put it into practice. In your name we pray. Amen.
Jonah prayed to God from inside the fish, and God ordered the fish to spit Jonah out. Ugh, yuck. God told Jonah again to go to the city of Nineveh to tell them what God had said about them. I get it, I get it. This time, Jonah obeyed God and went to Nineveh to deliver God's message. <coughs> the people of Nineveh stopped doing bad things and turned to God. They were saved because they listened to the message that God had given Jonah. This week I read a book telling the life story of a guy called Shane Taylor. He's described as one of the top six most dangerous prisoners in the UK. And I'm going to let you hear a little bit of his story. I could not put the book down. Could God change the life of a guy like Shane? Well, let's watch this clip and find out. I would encourage you to get the book and to read it and see everything that happened in his life. But let's enjoy this short clip now. I got in with the wrong crowd and I started to um, pinch cars, burgle houses, uh, become known, me and my friends become known as very high profile thieves really. I used to carry big knives, uh, the, the big knives to the smaller knives down my waist and I was the kind of person where if you pulled a knife out I would use it. I ended up stabbing someone in the head, I ended up um, Stabbing someone just missing his heart and going through the top of his shoulder, uh, the, the top of his chest and his shoulder away. He dropped to the floor, and so I was on the run for two attempted murders. And then I was just, when I went to prison, I had such a hatred for the system, and I couldn't handle being told what to do, couldn't handle prison officers mucking me about. When I went out on association, I got the prison officer and I, uh, I stabbed him. And then this led to me going into maximum security prisons, being put on CSC. It's where they feed you through a hatch in the door. There's no physical contact, so they have to have ride shields and ride gear on. Um, and that was my life for a long, long time, basically. And I, I just was going from prison to prison, prison to prison. But then I ended up going to Long Larton in Worcestershire. And when I was in there, I ended up going in an alpha course. Never heard of an alpha course, didn't know anything. And I just remember walking in because they'd sent me down. I sat down on a chair. And I thought, oh no, it's a Christian thing. And we'd just go there every week and I would argue. And the pastor, um, I remember he come to me. He said, right, I'm gonna say a few scriptures first before we pray. And one of them was, no one's righteous, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. And then he said the verses about Jesus and explained a bit why he died on the cross for sinners and stuff. And then he said, pray. So I started praying and I said, uh, God, I said, God, if you're real, 
come into my life because I hate who I am. And nothing happened. But then, as I was talking to the pastor, I started to feel this energy feeling in my stomach. And it started to raise up and raise up and raise up and raise up. And I just broke out into uncontrollable um, tears. And I just sobbed. <clears throat> and I just... Right there. Because that was a change in my whole life. I knew God was real. Um, and no one will change that now. And then I remember <laughs> running on the wing. People clearly knew that I would become a Christian. So I actually helped them on another two Alpha courses. And then I, I, um, I got released. I've been in a prison where I... Because you would have thought that the prison where I stopped the prison officers would have been the last prison to have me. But they were the first. That's how God works. The best thing for me is going in prisons and helping the lads in prison and, and trying to tell them about God. I've got um, four kids and then my life. Um, and what upsets me is because now I know um, that back then, if I had the kids, uh, they wouldn't have had a good upbringing. And now they sit on the night and have Bible studies with their dad. Um, <clears throat> have Bible study with a dad, have a life, a beautiful, um, and my life, and it's probably it's my wife and my kids are the best gift, that, apart from the grace God's given me, is the best gift I've ever, he'll ever give me. Didn't expect to cry like that. Recovered now. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. Washed in his blood Perfect submission Perfect delight Visions of rapture Now burst on my side Angels descending Bring from above Echoes of mercy Whispers of love This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior. I'm happy and blessed Watching and waiting Looking above Filled with his goodness Lost in his love This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long.
So this morning we're going to look at Jonah chapter 3 together and we're going to dig in and see what was happening in Jonah's life at this point. We're going to see what was going to happen in the life of those in Nineveh at that time and we're also going to take a look to see what God can do in your life and mine as we read his word. We're going to see today that God was able to take Jonah. Remember in chapter 1, as he ran away from God, as he disobeyed God, and he tried to go in the complete opposite direction rather than heading to Nineveh. When that great storm that God used to get his attention, and as he owned up to the sailors to say, guys, this storm is all my fault. You're going to have to throw me overboard. Jonah, at that point, must have thought that it was the end, but God intervened. And God sent that great fish to come and rescue him. And while he was sinking to the depths, to the deepest part of the sea, he was then swallowed up. And for three days and three nights, as we thought about last week, Jonah spent time being able to reflect and pray to God. He cried out to God for help and God answered his cry. When he was at the lowest and darkest place in his life, he said, you brought me up out of the pit. And he saw how God restored them. He says, God, I promised to make good what I promised to do. And at that point, we read that Jonah was spat out onto the shore. And in chapter 3, verse 1, we read the words that the Lord spoke to Jonah for a second time. We were reminded that God is a God of second chances and he wasn't finished with Jonah yet. And it's the same for us today. God is a God of second chances in your life and in mine. And he is not finished with you yet. So as we look at this passage, be open to hear God speak right into your life and right into your heart just now. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1 says this, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message of judgment I have given you. This was a message that God had given him. It was a serious message, an important message. Was it a dangerous message? Is that why Jonah done a runner the first time? He knew the reputation that Nineveh had and to take a message like we're going to discover could have actually endangered his own life. Well, we don't know, but we find out that the message that Jonah was given was a simple message. It was a direct message. It was a powerful message. And it also was a personal message. And we'll see that as we go through. But what was Jonah's reaction? How was he going to respond this time? Get up and go, Jonah. Well, it tells us in verse 3, this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command. And it's so important that as we start this morning, that we realise that it is really, really vital that we obey God's commands. First time, get up and go. If God is saying to you to get up and go, then don't delay Don't put the excuses in. Don't give us the what ifs, but just explore and discover what God has in store for you. As we saw in Jonah's life, it will save so many problems in so many situations if we just obey rather than disobey. And that's what Jonah did here. It says, he obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. Chapter 4 tells us that there was 120,000 people in Nineveh at this time. Jonah was going to take three days to go and discover every corner of Nineveh so that he didn't miss one person with the message that God had given him. And we're going to see in the next um, verse what that message was and the impact that it had. It says, verse 4, on the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. 40 days from now, Nineveh will be overthrown. And this is a really simple message, but it's direct. It's powerful and it's personal. Eight words that are recorded here that was the emphasis of Jonah's message. And how would the people in Nineveh react to this warning? to this direct communication from God, what would the response be to this warning? Now, we've got warnings all around us, don't we? I don't know when the last time you managed to go and get a cup of coffee and a cup like this, but on the side of these cups, it says caution, hot, or caution, contents, maybe hot. Because at some point, someone's had an accident or an injury 
and was, uh, because they've picked up one of these cups and maybe spilled it on themselves and not realised there was a hot drink in it. And it, the warning's there to protect and to inform. So also to stop this company from getting sued if something happened. But it's there to protect us from hurt and from harm so that we know exactly what is in there and the dangers that that could have. Think about if you've got allergies and you go to a shop to buy some food and you check the labels to see if there's any warning signs in there, things that you need to avoid, things that may cause you discomfort or even worse can cause death. And you need to be aware so that you can avoid and be protected from the dangers within. Although I have to say, the one that really baffles me is when a packet of nuts says may contain nuts. I would have thought that was pretty obvious. But there are warnings everywhere, warning signs, labels, and they're there for a reason. Think about when you did your driving test, if you've managed to pass that, and you had to look through your highway code to discover the difference between a sign that gave instruction and a sign that gave you a warning. It was there to warn you of the dangers that lay ahead so that you could take appropriate action, so that you could be prepared, so that you could adjust your speed, so that you could come to a stop. And these warnings are there for a reason. And some of us don't like it when we get a warning. It's almost like you try to take my fun away. I want to live life on the edge. And that's not at all what it's about. Have you ever received a warning from someone, maybe an employer or a family member or a friend. It feels a bit weird, doesn't it? It's not very comfortable. But if someone comes along and maybe sees something that's in your life and in my life and says, I don't really think that's the way that you should be living. I don't really think that's the way that you should be going. I don't think that's the attitude that you should have. I don't think you should do that anymore. How do you normally react and respond to that? Do you say, well, who do you think you are? I know best and this is my life and I want to live my life the way that I want to live my life. So you just go and do your own thing. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just doing what I can do. Or do you just ignore what people are saying and just go on with it anyway? You don't even um, process that warning that they've brought to your attention. Or do you say, ah, listen, I've got time to think about this. Let me reflect and meditate on it and come back to you with my response. It would be easy for the people in Nineveh, as Jonah came in, an outsider, someone they had never met, who's standing there shouting, saying, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed for the people to have that same reaction that you have and that I have in my life today. Away you go, who do you think you are? This is our city and this is our way. We'll do what we like. Or let's just ignore him. He'll go away. He'll go to the next street and shout at the next lot of people and see what happens. Or, listen, we've got 40 days to think about this. Let's reflect and let's try and figure it out. And I'll come back to you with my answer. Is that what happened in Nineveh? Is that what you do? Is that what I do in my life today? Well, we're going to see a real example from the people of Nineveh in the next verse and how they responded because it tells us the people of Nineveh believed God's message. It was as simple as that. They heard God's message and they believed God's message. They weren't going to wait around to see what was going to happen next. They saw how serious this message was and that they were going to have to change their lives. And it was fascinating that it was so quick. Did Jonah believe that people would respond so quickly to this message? 120,000 people, everywhere he went and he told them this news, they were all reacting the same way. I think that's quite remarkable and it really talks to me about my faith. Do I really believe that God can transform even one life, never mind a whole city? Do you believe this morning that God can do something in one life, never mind the whole of the town that you live in? Well, the people of Nineveh, Nineveh believed. It says from the greatest to the least, they decided to go without food and water. They went into a period of fasting and they wore sackcloth to show their sorrow. When people wore sackcloth, it was a real sign of distress, of sadness, often when death had happened. And here is this group of people, no matter their status in their town or in their city, they were all exactly the same. It was visible. People could see what was going on. And it didn't just stop with the people. 
It says when the, the mess, when the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. Here is this great man with all the authority and all the power. And when he hears this warning from God, his reaction is to step down. He didn't get his back up or try to justify what this city was like. Automatically, he stepped down. He took off those robes and he also wore sackcloth. And he went a step further. And he asked the people to join him. And he asked the people to get involved. Look at what it says that he did. He says, he dressed himself in sackcloth and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals, may eat or drink anything at all. We're all in this. And then he says, everyone is required to wear sackcloth and pray earnestly to God. This king said, everybody, I want you to get on your knees and pray. I want you to come before God and pray. And what was it he was asking them to pray? Was it he was asking them to pray for forgiveness? For a second chance? For God's grace? For God's compassion? For God's mercy? It just says, pray earnestly to God. But then not just that act of prayer. He wanted them to, to stop what they were doing. To no longer go down that path, to recognize the danger and see what was going to happen. He told them, he says, everyone must turn from their evil ways. Do a complete 180 on the way that you're living. And stop living that evil and wicked existence. And then he says, and stop all their violence. We get a little snapshot and a little picture of what Nineveh was really like. And the king says, enough is enough. We're no longer going to live this way. We're not going to operate this way. We're going to live God's way. And who can tell? Because the king must have had a glimpse. And it might have been through hearing about Jonah's personal story. About how God saved him and God gave him a second chance. How God rescued him in the belly of that fish. How God was able to do what seemed to be the impossible. Was that what inspired the king to get the people to pray? Well, it's not written here, but I've got a funny feeling that Jonah would have been able to tell the king exactly what had just happened to him. I don't know if Jonah had a chance to even get changed after being spat out of the belly of this fish. And the king, as he looks at him, saying, what's happened to you? But the king says, I want you to stop and turn from all your evil ways. Do you need to hear that this morning? Do I need to hear that this morning? Is it time to stop and turn and go God's way rather than my way? That's what we're seeing every time as we look at Jonah's life. Stop all their violence. Stop hurting other people. Enough is enough. The sin has to go and we need to focus on God. And I've really been challenged as I've looked at this passage again and as I've thought, you know, God, if I need to turn from all my evil, from all my disobedience, from all my sin, I'm going to need your help with it and I'm going to have to get on my knees and pray. Do you need to get to that place this morning? Will you join me as I try to live this out and try to figure this out as I hear God's warning? It's a simple message. It's a direct message. It's a powerful message, but it's a personal message. And this is what the king said. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will have pity on us. God will have compassion on us. God will hear our prayers. Perhaps even yet God will have pity on us and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. That was the king's desire. What's your desire this morning when it comes to living for God? The thing I love about this, this story of Jonah and how God took him to Nineveh is that I can see good things happening. I can see real change before my eyes. I can see that not just the, the individuals and the families, but the whole community has been transformed. And I would love to see that happen in our land, in our nation, in our communities, in our families, and in our lives. I would love us to hear what God has to say through his word. And as a result, hear the encouragement, hear the challenge, hear the warnings, and take action. 
And if that means getting on our knees and praying, if that means fasting and reflecting on what God has in store for us, if that's believing, God, will you have compassion on me? Will you forgive me? Can I experience your grace and can I experience your mercy? And I know today that it's promised. You see, in the New Testament it tells us the wages of sin is death. There's a warning. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. There's the alternative. So you can hear the warning and know what the result of living a life for ourselves and in sin will do. But we can see that there's an alternative. We can see that there's hope. And in verse 10, we read what happened with the the response of God as he sees what's happening firsthand in the life of the Ninevites. As he sees that they're repentant. He sees that they're sorry. He sees their sorrow. He sees that it's real. And it tells us when God saw that they had put a stop to their evil ways, when God saw that they had made this commitment to change, when God saw that they were on their knees in prayer crying out to him, just as he did with Jonah, he wanted to rescue them. He wanted to intervene. And it says he had mercy on them. And he didn't carry out the destruction that he had threatened. Nineveh was a changed place. Can you imagine being in Nineveh at this time as they all go from worry to worship? As they realise that God has saved them? And 120,000 people this day knew that God answered prayer. Knew that God could change the lives and the direction of the lives and protect them from the dangers and the damage that they were doing to themselves at this point because they'd stopped all their evil and they'd turned to good. They had turned to God. Do you believe that God can do the same today? In our lives, in our towns, in our families, in our nation? I do. There have been many great revivals over the years where God has come in through his power and through his spirit. And it's just gone through the land. I would love to see it again. Because when I look at God's love for Jonah, when I look at God's love for those sailors who cried out to him, when I look at God's love for the people of Nineveh from the greatest to the least, when I see the the response of God to the king's cry and call to prayer, when I see what God can do then and look at what God can do now in my life, in your life, If we just listen, if we listen to the warnings, if we see what the next step is for us and we then put it into practice, believing the people of Nineveh believed God's message. Do you believe God's message this morning? Do you believe in God's power? Do you believe in God's grace? Do you believe in God's love? I can guarantee you that when you recognize that the wages of sin is death, That that's the warning. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Through Jesus, that will transform your life. It will transform your future. And it will transform your eternity. Imagine we just all believed. Imagine we all repented and turned. Imagine we all cried out. And imagine we all put our life in God's hands. Some people think that warnings are there to take away our fun and dampen our experience. That is not true at all. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life in all its fullness. And when you know God and when you know Jesus, then it opens up a new experience that you could never imagine. And I would love you to take that step today and believe like the people of Nineveh. If God has told you to get up and go and take this message that God loves the world to everybody that you meet, then don't delay. No more excuses. No more what ifs. This simple, direct, powerful and personal message. Eight words that are recorded for us. Changed lives. And I believe they can still change lives today. When you say to somebody, do you realise That a life without God and a life without faith isn't going to work. 
but a life with God and a life with faith through Jesus could transform your life right now. It'd be amazing to see what would happen when people believe. Do you believe? I believe. And I want to see what God's going to do in my life. And yes, I'm going to mess up. And yes, I'm going to get wrong. And as we see in Jonah, as you continue to read, he still makes big mistakes. But God's still got a plan for him. God is not finished with him yet. And that's the same for you and me this morning. So let's live in this truth. Let's experience this truth for ourselves. And let's be encouraged to see that God gives Jonah a second chance. The sailors a second chance. The people of Nineveh a second chance. And he'll give you a second chance. Because as I've said, he's not finished with you or me yet.
I want to ask you a serious question as we finish today. Do you believe that God can do today what he did in Nineveh, in our town, wherever you are? Do we have enough faith to believe that God has given us a message and it is a message of hope and it's a message that can transform lives and transform communities? It's a simple message. It's a direct message. It's a powerful message. And as I said earlier on, it's personal. And I believe that God is going to change our land, but it's going to happen one person after another, after another, after another. It's going to start with you. And it's going to start with me. Do we believe that there are greater things yet to be done in our lives because God's not finished with us yet? Do we believe that there's greater things to be done in our town and in our nation and in our world if we come back to God? I think about the motto for Glasgow that used to, to be there. Let Glasgow flourish by the preaching of your word and by the praising of your name. And over the years, people have chopped that to bits to say, let Glasgow flourish, but let's take God out of it. Just take a look around and see the mess and see the difficulties and see the things that we're facing because God has been taking out the picture of so many areas of our lives. We need to get back to the preaching of his word and the praising of his name and then we'll see our lives flourish. There is greater things yet to be done in your life and mine. Do you have enough faith to believe? Let's get up and go. Let's obey what God has in store. Let's stop running away. Let's see what God can do today in your life and through your life as a result of hearing, of obeying, and then seeing what he can do. It's not about what I can do. It's about what he can do in and through us. So I hope you're encouraged today to see that God is the God of the second chance for Jonah, for the people of Nineveh, for the sailors. That God is not finished with you yet. What is in store? What's going to happen next? I'm excited to be on that journey with you. But as we take a moment to pray, are we going to commit our lives right now and say, God, I believe you have got greater things for me. Reveal it to me. Teach me. Help me understand. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this study that we've looked at in the life of Jonah. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done in and through him. I thank you, Lord, for the lessons that we've learned. And we know he didn't always get it right. And we don't always get it right. But God, you want to do new things in us. You want to help change us and transform us to be more like Jesus. Help us to get up and go. Lord, if we need to take this message to people that haven't heard it before, give us the boldness and the courage. Lord, if there's somebody watching today and this is the first time that they've heard that their life is in danger, if they live it without you, help them to reach out and respond immediately. But Lord, help us by hearing your word and by praising your name, see that we can flourish today and that there is greater things still to come in our lives, in our town and in our world if we trust you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.